Logan, and welcome back to my discussion of my book I'm working on, Battle Spaces of Mind, about uh, neuroweapons, the history of neuroweapons from 1919 to the present. Today we are talking about Chapter 2, Information Warfare. Information warfare is something that is ongoing constantly. There is no rest from information warfare. The battle for your mind and your heart is a constant endeavor whether it's um, for geopolitical gain or for partisan political gain or any um, anything related to just about anything socioeconomic is going to have some element of information warfare. Information warfare is the use of, of course, information to conduct um, operations. Uh, in the modern context, it's the ability to persuade your enemy to do what you want instead of you having to fight them to do what you want. Information warfare, uh, we see this every day in the so-called fake news that Trump's always going on about, which uh, as libertarian socialists, we actually agree with the people he's calling fake news is usually fake news, but so is Fox News a lot of the time, just fake news. Most information people are getting today are from a specific ideological silo within a social network that is served up by computer algorithms. And these algorithms constantly just churn out all kinds of information. There was a, a US military analyst and officer named Tully who wrote about the influence machine. And this is what we're constantly dealing with these days is all these various uh, algorithmically driven, artificially intelligence driven uh, algorithms that are, that are basically pumping out all kinds of disinformation all the time. Um, information operations, what we do with information operations is we are trying to take care of our, our world. So if we have an affinity group and, and what we might consider our information operations, we want to make sure the information we exchange between members of the affinity group or spokes council are secure and trusted. Even if it comes from within the person, it may not necessarily using neuroweapons, be their actual thoughts. And we'll get into this later. Um, information operations is basically security culture within our anarchist scene. We know the term security culture and all these things. The components of security culture or information operations consist of electronic warfare, uh, computer network operations, psychological operations, military deception, and operational security. Electronic warfare is use of, you know, anything, and sending electronic signals, sending radio frequencies, or sending electromagnetic waves. Uh, in riot situations, we now know of directed energy weapons that are used against protesters to cause them to be dizzy and to um, feel nauseated, so they'll stop protesting. That's an example of electronic warfare. Computer network operations, we're familiar with computer network operations, the necessity to secure your networks, even though there is no real security with quantum uh, um, computers coming online that can decrypt anything that you encrypt with typical um, RSA encryption today. And, and all these things will not be secure in the future. And even anything you send today in the future, as we know, the NSA collects all emails, all communications, there's no doubt about it, thanks to Snowden and his revelations about the computer network operations that the NSA has engaged in, even against benign allies such as Angela Merkel, the leader of Germany, the NSA engaged in spying on her through computer network operations in other ways. Um, so you have to beware Anything you say through an electronic communications device is going to be captured and they're going to know what you're saying. And even if they can't decrypt it today, in the future they will be able to. Now, psychological, psychological operations, uh, this is basically what this entire book is about. That's what neuroweapons are. It is a psychological operation. What is also a psychological operations in using neuroweapons that includes military deception. Military deception, the most famous example almost everybody gives is D-Day. 
What the Allies did to deceive the Nazis was they pretended they were going to invade in further northern parts of France instead of their actual target, which they seemed to have no interest in, which was for the south. This is like a, a standard military deception example. So you want to deceive your enemy. You don't want them to anticipate your every move. Operational security is the things we do to secure, to make sure our information is valid and real, and the information we send out is valid and real, unless we are trying to deceive someone in sending out this information. <coughs> Now, when it comes to military deception, you'll hear a lot of uh, commentators today talking about how the Russians are using, um, mus uh, sorry, I've had, this is a hard word for me to pronounce, maskarovka, which is the Russian word for deception, military deception. Um, we need to understand that all military intelligence organizations, all intelligence organizations everywhere practice deception. It's like one of the key elements of their trade. Um, what psychological operations grew out of, and that's primarily what we're going to talk about now, is um, this German, the Germans and the British came up with, with um, what they basically called worldview warfare. It's basically political warfare. Now, political warfare, uh, to quote this uh, one author who has been studying uh, psychological operations and propaganda, um, his name is Simpson, from his 1994 book, um, uh, The Art of Coercion. Uh, British and Nazi German strategies and tactics in the field have historically been termed political warfare. And, uh, sorry about the pronunciation, Weltanschauungskrieg, worldview warfare, respectively. Each of these conceptualizations of psychological warfare explicitly links mass communication with selective application of violence, murder, sabotage, assassination, insurrection, counterinsurrection, etc., as a means of achieving ideological, political, or military goals. These overlapping conceptual systems often con contributed to one another's development while retaining characteristics of the political and cultural assumptions of the social of the social system that generated it. So we can see that um, psychological operations are about changing how people see the world. Psychological operations are about um, engineering consent, basically. Psychological operations are to engineer consent, whether it's in a political campaign or a military campaign. Now, um, the scientific understanding of psychological operations began after World War I uh, with, in the United States. Um, in the United States, scientific understandings began with uh, a person named Harold Laswell, and this is in 1926. Uh, in 1926, Harold Laswell um, wrote a book called uh, Propaganda Techniques in the World War. Um, psychological warfare is a look at how powerful elites manage change, reconstitute themselves in new forms, and struggle to shape the consciousness of audiences that they claim as their own. Now, this is um, also Simpson, Science of Coercion. One of the most um, famous things that Laswell came up with in communications theory was um, this concept, who says what? To whom? 
Who says what to whom is like? Um, with what effect? <coughs> so we can uh, see the primary thing is to get an effect out of what you're saying and you have to keep the audience in mind too. So he's uh, basically, uh, this is all like um, basic stuff in propaganda. Now, this is in 1926, after the war. Um, another person who came onto the scene, another, uh, well, Laswell um, was a part of the American Expeditionary Forces in World War I. Um, so he was studying it from a military perspective initially. He later got into, you know, the political realm and these, all these different ways you can use information warfare. Another person to come on the scene was uh, Walter Lippmann, who also was a World War I veteran and worked in uh, intelligence in World War I. Uh, so he also started studying these things. One of the most important concepts that Walter Lippmann ever gave us was the concept of a stereotype. A stereotype, a vast overgeneralization of any characteristic uh, known in existence. Um, but basically, what we see is uh, increasingly the to whom is to a stereotype. In other words, they're engineering people to be various stereotypes. And we're increasingly being put in these various stereotypical silos and taught not to, and basically being conditioned not to communicate with each other outside of these very specific silos, which is problematic for any functioning society when everything becomes fragmented and it becomes split apart. So we can generally see how um, we're just being manipulated constantly. Now, um, there's a very interesting element to this in who was financing again. Who's financing the research into psychological operations? The funders of this in the early days was the Ford and also the Rockefeller Foundations. And we're going to continuously run into the Rockefeller Foundation financing various elements of uh, research into what are known as neural weapons or psychological operations, especially um, before World War II and during the 50s and 60s. Then it kind of falls off after that point. Probably some cultural change occurred in the Rockefeller Foundation or something like that. But uh, one thing that I, I want to talk about regarding this is that there was this discussion within the Rockefeller Foundation because there, uh, some members were, uh, of the board who were overseeing these, these researches were concerned that it was becoming authoritarian and totalitarian in its um, implementation. Uh, to read uh, a little passage from uh, Simpson's book, one Rockefeller seminar participant, Donald Schlesinger, former dean of the School of Social Science at the University of Chicago, blasted Laswell's claims as using a democratic guise to tacitly accept the objectives and methods of a new form of authoritarianism. We, uh, Schlesinger is saying, we, the Rockefeller Seminar, have been willing, without thought, to sacrifice both truth and human individuality in order to bring about given mass responses to war stimuli. Schlesinger contended, we have thought in terms of dictatorship by manipulation. Schlesinger's view enjoyed some support from other participants and from Rockefeller Foundation officers such as Joseph Willits, who criticized what he described as authoritarian or even fascist aspects 
of Laswell's purpose of control was a key to element to the promulgation of this research. Oops, sorry. I'm get the reference. To go back just a little bit. Rockefeller Foundation officers such as Joseph Willits, who criticized what he described as authoritarian or even fascist aspects of Laswell's arguments, despite this resistance, the social polarization created by the approaching war strongly favored Laswell, and in the end, he enjoyed substantial new funding and an expanded staff courtesy of the foundation. Schlesinger drifted away from the Rockefeller seminars and appears to have rapidly lost influence within the community of academic communication specialists. So he might have even, you know, for, for voicing this dissent, he might have even faced some professional um, suppression, basically, is what you might call that. But that's interesting. Um, we're going to take a break here, and when we come back, we're going to get into how OSS and the CIA, and specifically Bill Donovan, was involved in the creation of psychological operations on a mass scale.